Hi, this is Kim with the My Sexy Business team, and I'm here with my precious co-host, Christy Bridges from One Moment Wiser. She has rocked the co-hosting uh, title this week. We are on day three. I can't even believe this is day three of our four-day conference. The Hope to Hope conference came from a very um, heavy, hard, painful experience in my life, which was the path of my son and when I learned some things and that's exactly what happened during the process of grieving and, and you know moving forward I learned some things and I wanted to put that in something that would help other people be able to have hope and so that's how the conference got started was that we have all been through some things some inflicted on us, some we inflicted on ourselves, but things. So I am excited about our next guest. She's actually a friend of our friend, Connie Myers. Yes. And she has, I just am excited because we were like starting before we started. And so we had to just stop talking because we were going to, you know, explode or something before it. <laughs> before it started. We didn't want to keep her all to ourselves, but we were having a good time, y'all. So I'm actually going to let her um, help me introduce her because she's got so much. I will get it wrong. I know. So Elena Ledoux, thank you so much for coming on the Hotel Conference. Well, thanks so much for having me. I had no idea you are that woman that Connie was telling me about. I love the story, so I'm just so on. I just found out literally a few seconds ago, so I'm, I'm just totally, you know, I, I, don't know. I have no words. So, <laughs> well, but see, it's, it goes both ways because she's been telling us all about you, and so your yes. ears should have been burning because we were thinking we can't wait for you to get on here. You are a powerhouse. <laughs> Yes, thank you. thank you so much. So tell us your background so that everybody knows, like, who you are. Tell us tell us what you would, like, want the world to know about you. Well, um, I'm actually, like, a child of the world. I'm from all over. I was born in Uzbekistan, which actually I was born in Soviet Union, and then it became independent state of Uzbekistan. Oh. Uh, so my native language is Russian. I'm ethnically Korean. I lived in Hawaii for many years, so I'm, I'm a mess. I have a French last name, first Russian name, right? So <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I feel like completely Americanized, and I feel very patriotic. As soon as I landed in the U.S., which was 18 years ago, I felt like this is it. This is where I belong. I felt like a fish for the first time, you know, hitting the water. I just felt like I belong here. Everything that happens here matches how I feel. It's not perfect, but it just aligns just just so. I feel like every person has that place where they belong, and I felt this about U.S. Like it, it's all about being independent, being free, being strong, you know. And you know, it comes with all, like no, not a lot of people will help you, maybe, but you there's no ceiling per se. I mean, there's some ceilings, right? But not as much as in some of the other countries that I've been to. So. I feel like it's all up to me and I can literally do anything I want to. And if, if when I was a kid growing up, if somebody told me like, you're going to go to, to America, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be a businesswoman. I would laugh so hard. I'd probably fall off my chair, you know? So <laughs> never. in fact, when I was taking geography and I remember very specifically, I was in uh, maybe middle school or high school and there we're studying United States as economy, geography. And I remember looking up and then thinking, I'm never going to need that information and going down and starting just doodling. I just skipped completely that lesson, right? And that, which I regret because by the time I immigrated, I, had, I knew nothing about the United States. So it was just, I had to learn everything from scratch. Uh, but I went to law school. I, um, before that, I actually went to school to be a diplomat in my home country. And so when I came here, uh, so it was like a peacemaker and then the fighter, right? I went to law school. I did that. I love law. I practiced uh, litigation for 11 years in Honolulu. Um, oh, wow. I took a two year sabbatical in Europe with my family. Decided to be a mom for, you know, for. I had my uh, second son. My first son, my mom basically raised him because I was always working or studying or doing something. And so my second son, I decided I'll just, I'll be a mom. 
you know, because my, my husband said, what do you have to prove now? You know, this is probably your last kid, you know, let's do this. <laughs> yeah. And we lived in uh, Nice, uh, and we lived in um, Ireland. We lived in rural Ireland, like really cows, and we're looking in my windows, you know, it's very traumatic. And so <laughs> so uh, we did that, but we really loved it there. And then I had, um, we did Turkey, we lived in Bodrum in Istanbul, and we did Spain. So it was uh, unbelievable, life-changing. It, it, and it's because we kept talking about how we would both, my husband and I would both love to do that, be expats and live overseas and live in Europe specific, specifically because we love, I love art and culture. And then my husband loves great coffee and great beer. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. and so we decided Europe would be a perfect place for us. So um, we kept talking about it. And then he said, you know what? Like, how old are we going to be before we decide to actually do, you know, do what we really, truly want to do? So we just took off. We sold our real estate in Hawaii. We paid off the credit cards. We lined up, you know, savings. And we just went. I quit my job. And, you know, he still had this business that he ran online. But aside from that, we just we just left. And I was full-time mommy for the first time for uh, two, two and a half years. Um, wow. The, wow. Yeah, it was incredible. I highly recommend it. I know it's scary because you live in the career, income, everything. But it was life-changing. And I was telling my friends how in the past, you know, I thought, I never thought about it actually fully, but after the sabbatical and after living with my family, I actually brought my parents too. So it's after living fully my dream, I'm not afraid to be hit by a bus, you know, like fly it because I know I live, right? So I know it registered, you know, I met the love of my life. I had two amazing kids. I have amazing friends. I traveled all over the world. You know, I've done what I, everything I wanted to do. Everything I, I have no bucket list because I've done everything, right? So uh, now if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, I don't, I'd be like, okay, like, okay. Like, I'm okay with that. You know, it's like, I'm not going to <laughs> so, um, so I did this for a couple of years. Then we came back to U.S. and we settled in Vegas. So that's, you know, why not? It's, we just need a great airport because we left traveling. <laughs> And I loved how Vegas is very uh, business. Like, it's all about business. It's very, all the roads are wide. And you can tell it's just made for convenience. And everything is new, well-maintained. And I remember one of our uh, rentals had a, it was a, a condo. And the air conditioner blew. Like, something happened. And it's an older building. And so I had to find, I think we we're still in Europe. So I had to find somebody to replace it. And they said, oh, you know what we have to do with a crane from the roof? And I said, oh, my gosh, you know, how long is it going to take? And they're like, well, if you pay us now, like, it, we're going to be there in two hours. And I said, what? You're going to replace air, replace air conditioner from the roof with a crane in two hours? Sure enough, they did. You know, I just oh, love yeah. how, especially when you're somewhere in Spain, where things like that are not going to happen for two weeks, you know. So no matter what you do, it was very, I was amazed by how efficient Vegas was. It's convenient. It was very much all about business. So I, and I love that because I'm all about that too. I like everything. And my husband thinks it's more like Disneyland where it's all artificially made, you know, like it's clean, but it's all very lined up. There's not a lot of, like Hawaii is opposite. It's not very well maintained, but it's all about beauty and spirit. And it's, you know, it's different, right? It's, but there are things that are like crumbling here and there, you know, it's not perfect. It's not a Disneyland, right? Whereas Vegas is definitely like Disneyland, but I love that. I like that matches my personality. So we moved here, and uh, I never wanted to go back to law, even though I really love doing law. But I felt, you know what, I just want to do um, be free because I tasted the freedom. I don't want to belong to anybody else. I don't want my time to be accounted for for every you know six minute increment. And so, uh, but then my <laughs> best. <friend. laughs> I'm sorry. Build build hours, yeah. Yes. Every time you breathe or think or do anything, you, know, you have to build for it. And so I, it's kind of, and I love it. And it's when I first started practicing law, I thought I'm actually getting paid to do to do this. You know, I would actually pay to do this. I love doing this. So uh, I don't necessarily. I didn't leave it because I didn't like it. I did love it, but I love my kids more, and I love my freedom even more. Like so, it's so hard to then say. And even as, for example, if you. Uh, partner right in the law firm you still belong to the clients you can't just take off to go hey i'm going to australia to see my friends for two months bye see you later because you have deadlines you have things that need to happen otherwise you're letting the client down so um i didn't want to give up my freedom when i came back 
But my best childhood friend immigrated to U.S. I haven't seen her in 16 years. And then she says, we won the green card lottery. We're coming with my family. Uh, find me a job. And I was like, um, it's a little bit difficult if you don't speak English. You're a Russian-speaking architect with no, you know, history of employment, with no car. It, it's just hard, right? So then we decided to start a business. I'm like, well, let's make you a job. Because now she's coming with her entire family, two kids and a husband. And I'm thinking, um, you know, they need to eat something, right? And I even told her, like, if you work for me, I'll hire you. You know, you help me. And she said, no, there's no way. Like, I help you, but I will never charge you anything. So I was kind of stuck, right? So what do you do? So we decided to start a business that requires very little capital investment and very little communication skills, right? So it was cleaning. And, you know, we were like, okay, we both know how to clean. Now, how hard could it be? Right? So we took my vacuum cleaner, took some, you know, tissues. We actually, when we first got our client, we um, hired a contractor cleaner. And we, we, we said, please go with us because we're so scared. We don't know what the hell we're doing. And we're like, just show us what you do, you know, just show us. We said, okay, don't worry, I'll go with you. So we went and we we're so scared, but we cleaned it. The client loved it. And so it just went, it just snowball from there to two years later we won a bunch of awards we're a top rated company in las vegas we're best of las vegas we won angie's list award we have um 40 employees we just bought our own building and so it's it just kind of like spiraled out of control <laughs> and so um and then i started looking for even back when i was practicing law i found very hard to combine career and family Right. And like, OK, there's some people who are career oriented. There's some people who are family oriented. What if you're both? What if you like want to be a mom? Right. As I discovered after all these years, and you still want to have you want to fulfill your potential. Right. Because I feel like the one thing about U.S. that's great and it's my favorite part is that it's like a very fertile uh, soil for your I feel like a little seed. And I feel like it would be such a waste if I got planted and just grew like little or halfway, right? I feel like it, it's sad because who knows what's going to happen. After I'm dead, I may not get another chance, right, to, to do it. And so, and here, aside, when I was uh, taking um, citizenship test and oath, I was told, you look, once you become citizen, uh, you can literally do anything. You can be anything you want here. This is the land, promised land, right? And you cannot be a uh, U.S. president. And what was the other thing they said? So there's only like one or two things I can't do, but I can be U.S. vice president, you know, <laughs> and, and I can be brilliant. I can be literally anything else. And so I felt like uh, I should try and see, you know, see how far I can go, right? Um, so I, but when, once I got stuck between like this, like, do I want to be a mom? Do I, it, It's hard to be both. And I'm sure you guys can relate to that. Like every single, literally every single mother or even woman that I talk to can relate to that. Like I, I have my family taken care of and I have this. We we're all brought up to take care of our families, like first and foremost, right? And, and honestly, that's probably more important than anything else. But what about our personal, you know, potential, our personal growth, right? That needs some some things too. So I decided uh, that sometimes I'm just, when I did law and I would come home uh, after work, uh, my kids would be like, mommy, let's play. And I'd be like, I know you see me here. I know it looks like I'm here, but I'm not here. I just want to lay here in the corner and read some magazine. That's it. And I don't want to read the letters. I just look at the pictures, right? It's like celebrity <laughs> magazine. That's how much brain power I have left. Uh, and I kind of felt guilty because another thing we're really great at is feeling like mommy guilt. So I really felt that. And then I felt, okay, maybe if I drink something stimulating. And my husband, he's a great, like, at fitness, you know, and he generally, as, as a guy, like, he likes to take care of himself. He likes to exercise. He's very, very healthy. And so he told me, all you have to do is just go to the gym. I'm like, okay, sure, I'll go to law firm. And I do, like, 10, 12 hours of that. Then I hop in my car, I drive to the gym, right? I spend an hour exercising, then I, I take a shower, I drive back, and then I'll play with my kids, right? How, you know, like that, I'm sorry, but he's like, well, just an excuse. I said, no, 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 for real, this is not, it's not practical. I'm just not going to do that. And I'm not fitness freak, you know, I just don't want to do this. And so I started looking for some type of stimulant. And obviously, I'm not going to take like drugs or anything. And I noticed a lot of moms, they're, they're making jokes about drinking alcohol. 
right? Mommy, so they call wine mommy juice. And it's because that's what we need to like unload, like offload all the stress and all the stuff we have to put up with. And so I was like, and I, I don't drink alcohol. Like that's one thing I don't do. Uh, so I was looking, I started looking for like something like Red Bull, like energy shots. Right. Because I was like, that's a great idea. You drink it and then you're alive again and you can do what you want to do. Um, so I tried uh, Red Bull. I tried Five Hour Energy and I started looking, checking out all these different energy shots. And then I realized none of it was made for me. Right. So if you look at those drinks, they're very unhealthy. It's actually horrifying what they put in it. Uh, but they also look very uh, masculine. There's a dude running up the mountain. It's It's red and black and yellow very like testosterone and it tastes like uh, I'm sorry it's like a donkey pee you know it's just it really does not taste acceptable right and I, I think you know I was like I really don't want to put that in my body so it looks bad it tastes bad it's actually bad for me right and do I want to pay this high of a price to be able to spend you know personal time with my kids no, I don't want to. So I started looking for natural ways to gain energy besides driving to the gym and exercising for an hour, which I don't want to do. Um, but I couldn't find anything. And so I, I was driving one day and I was listening to this podcast called um, uh, How I Built This with Guy Raz. And he is a me. That's just my, my favorite podcast. And they were talking about a five-hour energy creator. And it's five-hour energy. They sell uh, $1 billion a year in energy shots. One billion dollars, and that doesn't—that's dwarfed by Red Bull and what other com- bigger like energy drinks companies do. And so he was telling me, uh, he was he was saying in the podcast that you know he was he had no experience in beverage industry, and he's an outsider. He actually is not even entrepreneur. He was just a uh, kind of like dude, you know. He he was a monk in India, and then he came. Uh, to back to US and he didn't know what to do. He just was going to sell something. He didn't even invent the drink, the fiber energy. He, he just kind of copied, reverse engineered it from someone else. So when I was listening to that. I was like, hey, you know, it's like I'm an outsider. I have no experience in beverage industry. You know, I actually I have a better idea as to what it should be like. It should actually look good. It should taste good, right? It should be more. Uh, for someone like me, because I feel like I needed more than, like, say, a, well, I don't know. Like, I feel like if you're a truck driver, then fiber energy is for you. You can drink it. It will wake you up. You have your eyes wide open just for that stretch of road that you need it for, right? Mm-hmm. Do it, but uh, that's fine. Or if, like, you are maybe a race car driver or something or extreme sports guy, you want to drink Red Bull, fine, more power to you. But I feel like I don't want to – I like my liver, so I felt like I want something that's healthier. <laughs> Right, so I thought I'll drink something that's actually good for me. There's there's no toxic crap in it. It wakes me up, right? And it tastes good and it looks good. So I feel good about taking it. So um, it's not that how hard could it be, right? So I started uh, thinking about how to put it together, and I almost immediately got an investor and uh, as a family friend of ours, and it kind of all started just rolling. And it's something like once it gets planted in your brain. It's very hard to get it out because I, could, I couldn't see why it wouldn't work. Everybody I talked to, they're like, just let me know when it's out, you know, but because I really need it, right? So because mommies, all we have is coffee, basically, mm-hmm. right? We can't drink Red Bull because our kids watch us and judge us, right? So it, it, like, it's coffee, and coffee could be acidic, for example, and it also gives you very harsh energy. It's like you have jitters and you're like, hyper it's not you're not in a good state of mind or condition to actually um play with your kids or maybe paint or whatever you want to do or build your business you're very hyper and you're like jittery and it's just not a good state and so i felt like it shouldn't be caffeine based necessarily it should be something else um and then I posted something on my Facebook saying, hey, does anybody know a food scientist? Anybody out there? <laughs> and so, and one of my friends said, oh, you know what? There's this amazing lady, you know, her name is Elise, and she is a food scientist. She used to work for Whole Foods. She's great. She's all about natural and healthy stuff. Uh, it's just, I'll hook you guys up. And she also is from Hawaii, and she's also in Las Vegas right now. I said, oh, sounds perfect. So I drive out. I meet with her. 
she is amazing. She's just one of the, those people for it. You think like, how, do, how are you even real? You know, she's just great all around. And she's the founder of her own company called t -Lab. So she sat me down and she said, you know, she listened to what I'm trying to do. And she said, I'm going to help you, but I have to warn you, I'm going to talk you into tea. And I said, oh, come on. You know, I'm, as you know, everywhere in Europe and especially in like Soviet Union, they all drink tea. I drink tea since I was a baby, right? But I associate it not with energy, but more with calm. Mm -hmm. You drink it when you feel like you're drained and you're dead. You drink tea and you feel like you're alive again. But I never thought that that also is the kind of energy. It's not maybe like I'm going to break the mountain in a little pieces energy, but it's more like I'm going to be awake and, you know, I can do things energy. But I never thought of that that way. So she said there's a specific type of tea that is much more um, kind of, it's like a, concentrated tea and so it's matcha right and a lot of people already know what matcha is and but mostly people know because of the flavor because right? it has this nice flavor it's interesting you know it's exotic so people have been adding it to like lattes and it's just it's just one of those like that hippie kid not hippie kids but like hipster kids hipster kids love to, to drink right it's beautiful it's like green and if you go on instagram you see like they do matcha this matcha that and so you feel like you know, it's a fashionable thing to drink. But when you actually is, uh, so what Elise does, she actually travels all over the world. Literally, she's been to Nepal. She goes to the farms and she looks at how they grow their tea, whether it's organic, what they put in it. I even remember she sent me a photo of that field where our matcha came from. And there's like a spider. And I said, Elise, I don't want to use that photo. There's a spider on there. She said, look, spider means organic. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so there's no chemicals. That's why there's, which I didn't, I didn't, I'm like, okay, you know, I still don't like it, but I accept it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do at spiders to make sure it's a good tea? Right? She was, she looks at the, yeah, she looks at the process and then she tells me, okay, so matcha is, uh, so green tea, right? Regular green tea. And we all know it's good for you. But this particular green tea is out in the mountains. And about a few weeks before it's time to um, harvest it, they, they, sh they shade it from the sunlight. And so it, it, without photosynthesis, it starts to kind of build up those, like all the good antioxidants and things. It becomes like super, super like rich in antioxidants. Wow. And when they take the cloth off, they collect it, and then they grind it up into a powder. It's like a green powder. It looks pretty beautiful, right? And then you're supposed to like take that little like whisk and whip it up and like drink with a hot specific temperature of hot water, mix it up and then drink it. And the antioxidants that tea, the matcha tea has, because you consume in the whole leaf now. Usually tea is just water. You throw away the leaves. In this case, you consume the leaves and it has 20 times more antioxidants than like blueberries or goji berries. It's super great for you. Wow. And a lot of times people tell me like, why don't I just buy matcha and there's not better to drink matcha than you drink? And I said, yes, it is better. If you can get the best matcha, when well, we found absolutely the best matcha in the world, like that's something that super expensive, like, ouch, I just had to pay the, you know, that part for that. really expensive, but it's absolutely the best. You cannot get better matcha, right? So because I'm going to drink it, I'm, I don't want to drink something that's not great. It's absolutely great. And, and they have lower grades that are cheaper. They have the cheapest, they have acceptable, and they have the most, the best, the most expensive. So we got we went for the top, right? And so, I, and if you can find that, which you can, and you can't even buy it here, you have to go through like specific somebody like her, right? Expert, tea expert. You find it, you you bring it over, you mix it in the special mix, and it's a powder, right? So it gets everywhere, like up your nose, everywhere. <laughs> mix it, you, and then you drink it. So how likely is that you're gonna do that? As if you have one kid in one arm, you, know, you have your laptop in the other, and then you have to go through all these steps, and then you drink it, and by far it's the best thing you can do. But I'm like going for the second best, which is you just open the bottle, just shake it up and drink it, and then you're good. You get the same effect. And in fact, just to make sure that it's like, um, how should I say it? It's more... I, like it, when we're formulating this, I thought... Okay, so matcha, like Americans, they're not used to drinking straight up matcha tea. It's, it's just something that's just, they just don't do. They add sugar to it, they add milk, and protein actually kills a lot of these uh, amino acids. Like it, it just counteracts it. So it's actually 
not as good as just straight up matcha, which I, I was like, I don't want to do that. I want to keep all the good stuff, right? It gives you this energy and focus. And at the same time, it relieves stress. The actual scientific studies show in the matcha tea, you, you become like not stressed out, not hyper, not jittery. And you have... We needed it for the conference. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, yeah. So I was thinking like, okay, but it's so great for me, but I don't want it to taste like donkey bee, right? That's another thing. I, <laughs> I need to make it amazing. Like that's one of the things I'm, I was stuck on. I want to have great tasting uh, products. So I don't want people to drink like, oh my God, if I have to do it, I'll do it, right? Cause, just because they like you. Um, so when we lived in uh, France, one thing I discovered and fell in love with were French desserts, pastries. Oh my goodness. You know, I remember walking down the street and it was, I think it was in Paris. And I see a long line of people outside the tiny little bakery, like pastry shop. And I was thinking, hey, we should probably go check it out. Like, what are they all lining up for? And so we went and we discovered they're tiny eclairs, like this small, tiny little. And they cost like three or four euros, pretty expensive. And like, well, we have to have it. You know, there's, there's so many people. And, and we don't even know what the store is called. <laughs> right. So it was very uh, confusing for us. And, but we decided to try it. And the minute that we get into the eclair, like I almost started to cry because I realized I've never had a real dessert in my whole life up until that moment. Oh, wow. Because <laughs> a lot of desserts we, we eat, uh, like back in Uzbekistan and Russia and over here in the U.S., they're very one-dimensional. You just have one flavor profile, which is sweet, right? That's it. But that was like a rainbow of like very delicate flavors woven together. It was like a lemon and cream and... It was just like, it was very delicate, but you can taste like, a, you literally, you just, I was just floored. And so I thought wow. if I do the, this product of mine, it would be great to have like these amazing flavors that I just like eye opening. Right? And so I hired two chefs and then I discovered uh, that chefs and generally creative people, they're not very good at um, abiding by the deadlines, you know, working with the process. <laughs> so I had to let that one go, but uh, we tried to introduce interesting flavors like lavender and coconut is one of the flavors that we have. There's a honey, lavender, coconut. And then another flavor is rose almonds. And then my beverage development company that was helping me, and they actually do products for like Target and Whole Foods, and, you know, big manufacturers. They said, you're going to scare the GBs out of everybody with this lavender. Rose. Nobody knows what that is. So why don't you do like generic flavor that everybody's not scared of? So we did like lemon and ginger and honey. Like, so, so if you're scared to try lavender, if you're scared to try rose, you can try, you know, go for safety of lemon and ginger. And so all three taste good, you know, where it's not like a, it's not like a French eclair. I have to make that disclaimer. I mean, that's going to be probably phase two, phase three, but uh, we, at least we tried. Yeah, you try it and it tastes interesting, right? It tastes interesting. It's a little bit sweet. It's not like a really, really sweet. And it, it's a complex flavor. It's not a one-dimensional, just sugar, you know. It's actually, we only use honey and we don't use like sugar or stevia or whatever other you know, synthetic stuff that usually goes in your drinks. We don't use preservatives that are artificial. We use like um, citric acid, which is just lemon juice. So... Um, we actually did the crowdfunding campaign that's still running on Indiegogo. So if you go on Indiegogo and go uh, put in like Mommy Go, you can pre-order it. It's going to be produced like first. <coughs> oh, you got over like seven. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's where it's at. And that's my current project of, that I'm working on. I love flower scented teas. Lavender. What was the lavender one? Lavender. Yeah. Coconut, oh my goodness, that sounds amazing. And rose almond, how can you go wrong with that? We need, I, I love what you were saying about France, you know, you line up for this little bitty thing that is such a flavor that you realize you've never experienced before. And, and I like the idea that you put care into making that same kind of experience for mommies. It's not just here, you know, here's a kick in the pants so that you can play with your kids a little bit. But here's something you can enjoy so that you can spend your evening enjoying life. That's that's awesome. I like the reality of it, though, because I think you met me. I'm not going to 
spend the time to do all the powdery <laughs> thing. <laughs> and so I think that's another really huge part of like you're brilliant. I, and I've known that since Miss Connie told me. <laughs> but just the fact that you took real experience, real life and applied it, you know, even to your cleaning business. I, I just want to stop and make an acknowledgement of this. You, you have done so many courageous things. You've stepped out on, you know, the proverbial limb and then things that were not um, we're not the norm, we'll say. We'll say that it's it's not the the thing that everybody else would do when they wouldn't quit their job and you know move travel all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> but you also have not backed up from I mean, you have not backed up from trying to do the best you can with your kids, providing products, building businesses, building an empire, I will say. Mm -hmm. You know, doing those things, what, you know, I know that you're passionate about these things, but what is the underlying thing that caused you to believe that you could do anything that you set your mind to? And you go big. Yes. You go big with everything. You're not just cleaning neighbors' houses. I actually don't think I can do it. That's one thing I really struggle with. I think, like, I look like I'm a confident person. I'm not. I just don't think about it. So, uh, my motto, and I actually taught all my friends to do this, is this. If I do this, is somebody going to take me out and shoot me? No? Then I'm doing it. <laughs> and that's how I taught all my friends to do it. Wait, I want Miss Connie to make sure she puts that in the comments. Because that's stupid. If I do this, is someone going to take me out and shoot me? <laughs> no, then I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because if you think about it, like, what's the worst that can happen? So I start with business. So it fails. Okay, because I learned something, right? Uh, so I, you know, I go apply for law school. I'd be a lawyer, you know. If I, they get reject me, like, am I actually going to be shot if if I get rejected to law school? I don't think so, you know. So I just, I just do it. And and a lot of times, uh, there's one of my favorite sayings is like eighty percent or ninety percent of success is showing up. I truly yeah. believe it. Just show up and. Yeah, a lot of people don't show up. You'll be surprised because they, they hold their inner barrier, right? The brick wall. And they say, you cannot do this. And I think the same. You know, like everybody, I cannot do this. I am not like, no, I'm going to fail so hard. And even a mommy go, I'm thinking like, okay, who am I kidding? This is like, it's, it's a huge undertaking, right? It's It takes big money, it takes big connections. I don't have that. But... Uh, what if I, like, is somebody going to shoot me if I do it, first of all? No. And second, a lot of my friends, like, Elena, go for it. We believe in you. You can do it. And I have the best friend. That's one thing. That's my greatest asset. Actually, people around me, they're so strong. They're rallied, like, around me. And they said, you can do this. We believe in you. Like, I just got a check from a Honolulu from a, a really, really, like, we, we go way back. A very sweet lady. She's just like Connie. She sent me a thousand dollar check. She's like, I believe in you. Just do it. Like, and she doesn't even need mommy girl. Like, she she doesn't. She's retired. She doesn't need like a you know spike of energy for anything. She's just chilling in Honolulu, right? She's in Hawaii. Right? <laughs> she's like, I just believe. I think you know it's 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 a great thing, and I think I believe in you. I think you can do this, and it's a very common sentiment from my from my friends. They're like, we we think you can do this. We need to have people in our corner and we need yes. to nurture those relationships, not just because they can give to us, but because we can give to them. Right. I think it's cute that the, the show up part, because, you know, I do think that you're missing one part. And that is the part that all of these people that believe in you have watched you show up all along. Yeah. Like this wasn't just a suddenly thing that you just now started showing up. I believe this is a lifestyle. Yeah, I do. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like I get to live only one time. So if I don't show up, right, uh, that's going to be, which, and, and I'm naturally super lazy. I love my favorite thing to do, which I actually, sometimes I actually rent a hotel room and I just go in there. The end of the blanket. You spent all day with a silly magazine and candy. That's it. Like that's all. I do. And I do that at home too. Like if my husband says, "Like oh, we want to go somewhere. We're we gonna go," and then I just go, go, close the door. I lay down. I 
That's my favorite thing. I'm just naturally lazy, but I get involved in a lot of projects. I have a lot of friends. And a lot of times they say, I have some trouble. I need help. Or like, I'm moving to US. I need a job. And so I get kind of pulled into different directions and I show up and I do it and it turns into something. Okay. I have to correct you again. I, I have to because being lazy and then your friend saying she's going to come and you create an entire company so that you can give her a job is not exactly lazy. <laughs> you're going to be 40 employees and you know, no, I don't know that. We thought we just, I asked her, how much money do you want to make you know, to survive? Said, oh, I don't know, $1,000 a month. That was our plan, you know? So <laughs> I did not plan for that. Even like for my husband, I was like, I really, I'm not a business person. That's that's one thing I always said. I'm not an entrepreneur. I hate accounting, HR, and management. Like those three things I hate the most in life, you know? So but I don't want to deal with it. But I had to learn all of that, right? So once we started growing, I was like, wow, this is growing. Like, what shall we do, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it, though, because you are – you actually are motivated by serving. Like yeah. that's the thing that you're you're saying without saying it is you're actually motivated because you were trying to help someone you loved. You know, exactly. it's why you created that and now you you're the top cleaning, you know, company in Las Vegas. Yes. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, clients. But that is proof of one of the things that I say all the time. It is if you lead with serving, you know, if you're going out and doing it with the right motive and serving, all the rest of that will follow. Like yeah. if you yeah. show up and you do the work, all of the things that you, you know, aspire for, they'll come. It, it's attracted to the movement of showing up and doing the work. Yeah, and people ask me, because after uh, our success at Superb Mates, people reach out to me and ask, like, what's your secret? Like, how did you become so big? Because I've been in business for 16 years, 30 years. And I said, look, all you have to do is just, like, treat your customers well, treat your employees well. And they say, no, 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 what's really, really, what's your secret? <laughs> if you walk into the house, right, and that's really the secret behind our company's success, you walk into the house and there's a little old lady and you see that she wasn't able to keep, keep up her home, right? And it's distressing to her because her whole life, her home was immaculate, right? Mm -hmm. so I'm like, don't worry, we'll take care of you. And so we clean. Like, we clean like she was our grandma or our mom. Not only mm -hmm. will she clean, but we'll line things up for her. We'll make a little flower. I will pet her dog. Obviously, you know, we'll make her environment so beautiful and healthy and loving that she will keep us. And she'll tell, like, 10 of her friends all of her neighbors and she'll like maybe if she's tech savvy she'll leave us a yelp review or google review right that's that's how we come out of control like every customer brought like 10 more customers <laughs> i will never forget elena the time that my grandma who at the time she was 85 and she called me crying because she couldn't make the bed anymore and this is what she had done all of her life it was exactly what you were just saying all of her life her identity was around keeping this this beautiful domestic you know home in order and over the last 10 years or so she had um you know complained about the dust made jokes about it but she wasn't doing as much as she could and then one day when she was trying to change the sheets she'd gotten them off but she couldn't get them back on she didn't have the strength and she she boo-hooed the whole time I made the bet because it was such a blow to her ego. So I actually, you know, you say that you're taking care of these little ladies and and I know that it's just what you do, but it's a precious thing to treat them with the kind of respect that you do and, and make their environment beautiful. That's a very valuable thing. Yes. <laughs> and I you know, we're not in the cleaning business. You are making customers happy business. You go in, I don't check the quality of your work as long as the client is happy. I don't care if you drink tea the entire time or play with your dog or clean. It would be nice if you clean, but <laughs> yeah, I yeah, you know, I really, I don't as long as the customers are happy because each customer, they have their, this is their home. They tell you what they need because some, some of them only care about like AC vents. They just want them spotless and other people can, can like they, the clutter drives them crazy and other people... Mm -hmm. Uh, the flooring, the baseboards, they can't reach them. So whatever is it, or, you know, or they just want a company, they just want a human to talk to, whatever it is that they want, just do that. 
and make them happy and that's all that's that's our principle okay i think that in all your extra spare time that you have you should come be part of the my sexy business team because i'm pretty sure you teach or you're talking about all the things that i i talk about all the time you're living proof that what i'm saying is true yes yes absolutely i would love to yeah we should talk more about this um i think you know i did promise my husband i'm not going to start any more businesses although i just <laughs> <laughs> i love it <laughs> people who approach me with like things and my the thing that i found discovered for myself last year which i've never done is like community activism and empowerment of women yeah and i'm the type of person who uh always has good grades you know have their don't have any debt and you know like a part of the establishment you know like a good girl all of the all my stuff is lined up and you know it's just that's it like I'm, I'm a lawyer right so all like I'm just I'm not saying I'm stuck up but I'm part of the establishment I don't mm-hmm. I went through like being super poor in the beginning of my experience that totally totally broke and in like the worst possible way and so many people reached out and helped me but it's been many years since and I like I've never been poor for, for many many years right um, and I never thought I'm not one of those like let's go on the barricades let's burn some tires let's fight for civil rights. That's not me. Like, I'm just, I don't make trouble. You know, remember, it's a blanket and a magazine, right? That's me. Uh, and then last year, I ran into the situation now where one of my friends, I have a kid that uh, is HIV positive. It's hospital introduced. It's yeah, hospital error. So nothing to do with the child or even with parents, right? It's an innocent little girl. And um, I was um, shepherding them through, like, a medical system here because it's, convoluted with insurance and language barrier. So I found them the clinic at a local university at UNLV that does HIV treatment, which is, as it turns out, it's pretty rare in the U.S. to have a child with HIV, which thank God for that. So and you don't have a lot of doctors who specialize in treating children with HIV. It's just very, very exceedingly rare. But there is a clinic, uh, there was a clinic, and so I brought uh, them over there, and they saved their life. So there are wow. two the doctor and a nurse, and they took amazing care. I've still, not before, not after them, I've met, like, medical providers who will sit with you for an hour, let you cry on your shoulder, who will look at you, like, from all angles, be like, yeah, you know, I don't really like your color, let's try this, let's try. They actually care, like, they look at you like if you were their child, right? They don't look at you as if you were just, like, you waited for them for two hours, they run in for two seconds, and then run out, right? And then you get a big bill for it. That is my typical experience, I'm sorry to say, you know, with the medical system here. But these two, they're just totally, totally different. And the children that they took care of were thriving, right? So everything was going well. The little girl kind of was blossoming. And then the parents reached out to me because I kind of, I wasn't even communicating about that at all. They're they all set. And then the parents reached out and they're like, oh, by the way, you know, uh, there's some kind of problem with the clinic. We can't get medication refilled. And they said, oh, you know, like, it must be like a language barrier. Let me call them. So I start calling them, and they're like, yeah, you know, just go to your regular provider, regular pediatrician. And I said, wait, regular pediatrician doesn't know anything about HIV. Well, like, they're not, they're not going to do anything, which that's what the regular provider said already. So I said, well, I'm sorry, ma'am, we don't know anything. Just, like, get lost. And I said, well, uh, I'm sorry, but this was the only clinic we found in the whole region of southern Nevada. And that medication she has to take at 9 p.m. every day or else the virus will mutate and she'll die. She'll have AIDS and die, right? So when when was the last time you've heard that there's an American child who died from AIDS from being untreated, right? That's not going to be, that's not 1980s or 70s or whatever, right? It's right now, 2017. Um, so I, they said, I'm sorry, our clinic is done. We're not treating those kids anymore. And mm-hmm. I said, uh, what is the reason for that? And they said, well, we don't know. We don't know anything. Please go away. So I was like, uh, you were talking to the wrong person. <laughs> like, who's, your, who's your boss? Who made that decision? And I said, oh, there's a school of community health science uh, here at, uh, at UNLV. So I said, oh, all right, you know, let me give him a call. So I call him. Uh, he doesn't pick up the phone, doesn't respond to my call. I called, um, I opened up their website and I went through his cabinet members. I called every single one. <laughs> I was them. 
Yeah, they're like, we don't know what's going on either. This is the first time we hear about it. I'm sure it's a mistake. I was like, it's better be a really serious mistake because you're talking about a hundred kids, right? They were just tossed to die. So I hope it's a really, you know, something. But nothing happened. And so I said, okay, who's that guy's boss? Boss. And so they told me, oh, it's um, UNLV president, right? So okay, I opened the website. I called UNLV president, right? No response. I write to him as a lawyer, the mother. And that was really good. By the time I left my legal career, I was winning pretty much all, all the cases, right? So I write this very, very impassioned email to him with photos of the little girls with saying, like, look, we love those kids. We're not going to let them die. We're just not. That's not happening. So we will do whatever it takes to get them the medications that they need, right? So I send it, and I expect fully expect, like, frantic call or some kind of follow-up. Nothing. It's like a black hole. So, okay, that's that's not acceptable. So I called them. And it was right around the United Airlines incident where they beat up this little... Uh, oh, yeah. And right, drag him out bleeding like he was a doctor. Yeah. Um, yeah, I called the UNLV and I said, uh, the president's office, and I said, you know what? I'm coming to your office. And I'm bringing, you know, the parents with me. And I said, Miss Lady, please don't come. Because, you know, he's very busy. He can't meet with you. I'm like, I'm going to come and I'm going to see what is more important than 100 dying kids. I just want to see, like, what kind of business he has. If you guys want to beat me and drag me out, we'll be on CNN, right? It's going to be like United Airlines scenario. So go ahead. I'm coming. Because it's like you paint this into the corner, right? I'm not doing it because I'm brave. Because literally, is this girl, little girl, and other girl, and other kids are going to die? Why am I going to go and get beat up by security at UNLV, right? So, like, what choice would you make? It's not a choice. It's not. Like, any any sane person, especially a mother, especially a woman, you know, would just choose going to these bureaucrats, right? That's what you're going to do. So I went. Um, they were there. They were waiting for me <laughs> all day, they said. <laughs> they said, we didn't even have lunch, you know, because you said you can come in the morning. So they were very upset that I made them wait. Um <laughs> Um, I show up and they sat down with me, not the president, but VP and some other people. And they they said, okay, you know, we can't tell you what happened, but you're never going to see those doctors there again, those providers. And, but we're going to send you all to this adult clinic for, you know, HIV. It's usually like, uh, it's mostly serving like a gay male population uh, because that's who predominantly has it, has this condition in our <clears throat> And so I was like, I'm going to go check that clinic out, okay? Because, like, I just, I don't know. Like, I just, I, I need to see it. So I show up there, and there's, like, um, you know, AIDS posters everywhere. And then think about those kids. A lot of them, they don't know they have HIV. Like, their parents didn't tell them because it's a, such a traumatic process that, you know, you're not going to tell a four-year-old little girl that she has HIV. Like, what, you know, or even maybe 10-year-old. It's the, they're not ready mentally for that. You don't want them to be bullied or teased or you don't want them to like, go jump off the roof or something. You know, you just don't do that. So they don't know. So to go to this adult clinic uh, where it, it's like it's, it's a safe sex life posters, there's, you know, condoms, there's like, you know, it, it, it's like there's like STD charts, you know, it, it, it's like, no, 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 no. And I said, well, does any any of those doctors in those clinic do they have experience treating uh, children with HIV? Because it's on it's on it's on like you know science, so to speak. And they're like, no, but we can learn. And I said, no, 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 no. You're gonna be learning on <clears throat> children on these children. Yeah, I don't think so because you have great providers. You didn't have an explanation as to why they're taken away. They said that they forgot to file a that they failed to file a memo or something. I was like, that is the the, the craziest and stupidest things at the same time that I've ever heard in my life, right? So what memo? Well, we cannot talk about it. So it, it's a it's a hip hop. It's a hip. I'm like, no, try again. It's not hip hop. Try again. They're like, oh, it's <laughs> nah, you know. So okay, but they oh yeah, it's like they, they're trying. They, they're used to lying. They used yeah. to misrepresenting things, right? And just to get you off. But like, I'm very basic. Like, I'm not very smart. I'm very basic. So I'm like, it, things have to line up, right? If you say in HIPAA, is this a patient privacy violation? 
no, that doesn't fit. Try again, right? So they they really struggle with why they close it. And they, they ended up not giving any answer that was acceptable, even to this day. It's been I love like, it. It wasn't acceptable. Mm -hmm. I, I want to stop you real quick and just say, I love that you keep saying that, that that was not acceptable. Mm -hmm. that, that, it, that it wasn't just, you know, it's not okay. It was not acceptable. <laughs> you were not going to accept it. <laughs> well, I you know, like I turned 40 last year. And I felt like, uh, how am I going to live? I probably have another good 40 or 50 years to live, right? So I'm thinking, like, how am I going to wake up every day, look at myself in the mirror, knowing that somebody killed, like, 100 kids in front of me, and I did nothing. Yeah. All of this, like, and I, I, the one thing I'm not good at, I can't bullshit myself. You know, like, just something that, like, if I say, well, I thought somebody else would take care of them. And I tried. Trust me. I tried to pawn these kids off to, like, <laughs> Other, like I called every political office in the state of Nevada, every up and down, the, the governor, like Department of Health got involved. It, it's a, it, it was a storm. And, and the media, I called every national and local media outlet. And some of them did get like uh, Nevada Public Radio published, like uh, did a lot of things, the review journal. So there was just a lot of uh, things that came up, right? Uh, but there was not nobody who stepped up and said, well, let me take this off your hands. Because really, you're not a patient. You're not a periodic. Who are you, lady? Like, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't, and I said, you know what? I'm not, a, I'm not a political activist. I have a few friends, and I think Connie is actually one of them, who I called my revolutionary friends, right? Yeah, yeah. The ones, like, they're, like, I have one who's like a president of the union. I have another one who's like, even the, the tea lady, she's a revolutionary within tea industry. She go up against like tea mafia, like she, distributors, right? She goes into like Nepal and she, she just does this crazy stuff. Even these two providers that I ended up befriending them, they go to like Africa, to Nigeria, right? And they save this like a lot of lives there. Just, I don't. My thing is the blanket and the magazine, right? So I'm like, just please somebody take this off my hands. Please somebody save them because... You know, like, I don't think they should be killed. Like, I don't think they're just kids, right? So they didn't do anything. Just, like, save them. This is this is America. Like, we can't, we don't do this kind of stuff. This is not Nazi Germany in 1930s. You know, we just don't do this. Um, nobody really did. I even went to a lot of, like, AIDS and HIV advocacy. I'm like, look, remember those, like, charitable balls you hold where you collect, like, millions of dollars? Now it's, you ch and, like, chance to step in and like advocate do your thing or you know like do it because people give you like millions of dollars to save i'm not saying attack you know the just like just go and make sure that they get treatment i don't care from where just do it come on that's your job right that's literally your job you're getting salary to do it just do it no they didn't do it because uh i think politically you know the university is a big employer and so nobody wanted to go up against them, right? I don't want to go up against them either. Like, I'm sorry to say, like, that's like, if they weren't trying to do that, I would like, I would not even be anywhere in the picture. If somebody else, I even went to Catholic church. I'm like, come on, guys. You know, there's like a, a, a what do you call it? Like, um, charity just for like eight, yeah, eight uh, patients. And they help adults. And they said they're highly powerful and well-connected. So I went to them and I called and I was like, please, just... Let's, uh, you are Catholic priest, please say, let's show mercy to these children. You know, just say that. And that should be enough. Just say that in the newspaper, right? <laughs> I heard from them again. I swear to God, like, this is like this. I was thinking, like, I must be crazy or, like, this is not happening. Am I crazy? Like, I was asking my friends, am I crazy? Like, is this really happening to me? You know, because I would like to wake up. You know, like, I don't like this. Um, but this was a reality. And, you know, we ended up finding an attorney for one of the patients, a four-year-old girl. She sued the university and they ended up reopening the clinic. They still didn't give it back to the same providers. They found somebody somebody else to do this work. And a lot of money on it and all of that. So the treatment was resumed eventually. But it, it cost, like, I lost 10 pounds. Like, I, I tell you ladies, like, the best way to lose weight, <laughs> which I was trying to lose, like, five pounds for the last, like, 15 years, probably, and I couldn't do it, because remember, I don't exercise, right? And I love sweet. But, like, going through something like that, you don't feel like eating, right? And so I, it was, I was, I, I look so much better, you know, after this. So it's like a, it's like a side effect, right?
I look I look fantastic after after I was done with that. And so uh, the the case is at the last stages already, uh, and the clinic was reopened, and you know no one's gonna die anytime soon, mm-hmm. hopefully. Um, and then I got uh, involved in the nonprofit that ran by the same providers because I found out all the I started like basically investigating just as a like an attorney, right? As a mother, I wanted to figure out what happened, and I found out that there was a lot of discrimination happening within the school, and I'm told that a lot of um, institutions of higher education experience like the academia they have a lot of like inner struggles so to speak and some of them are related to discrimination and harassment and bullying right and some institutions are better at investigating and handling those and others are not so great at it and so uh the clinic the shutdown of the clinic was part of retaliation by the dean the, the doctor right so um that didn't make me feel good. Like, okay, not only you're trying to like let all these kids die, but you're doing it for racism reasons. That like that doesn't like I'm a I'm I'm a mom, but I'm also a minority woman. Like I just don't like that stuff, right? That's just not that's not acceptable, right? So try <laughs> killing them for some other reason, right? So something higher than that. Like you try to save money or something, at least be like decent about it. But not for racism, right? Come on, guys. Like how many evil things can you stack up? And so right. Yeah. yeah, so I actually reached out, like Connie actually reached out to me at the same time and I, I was talking to her about it and that's why she said, I thought we fixed that stuff back in the 60s and 70s. That was really, you know. Yeah, but no, it was not fixed all the way, unfortunately. So we still have to, we have a lot of work to do. And I started to actually thinking, you have somebody like that, like amazing providers who actually go around the world and save children. It could be here in the US, it could be overseas. Um, their organization in particular called Healthy Sunrise Foundation. What they do, they would go and they would um, educate local doctors and nurses about how to provide basic care for and screening for these pregnant women. Because if what happens is uh, they have like a rampant HIV uh, rates and AIDS over there. And so uh, if you have AIDS and you're given birth, no one will touch you. Your baby will die in you during birth. Just... <clears throat> And uh, I was watching this video of this woman talking about it, right? And it was very traumatic to me to listen to because, no, you know, no, no, this is horrible. This is not happening. But it happened to her. She's a young woman. And so they went and they educated uh, the staff there, right? And so they tested people. So this, this woman ended up having a second baby, completely healthy, perfect. And she just holds them, holds her, saying, this is my baby, right? This is her name, Miss Cherry. <laughs> so they go, and so you feel like, when you have people like that who are saving the world, who are not laying in the blanket at home, right? We should throw money at them. We should uplift them. We should help them do anything it takes, right? And those kind of people, they're not good about uh, about generating money. It's one thing they don't care about, right? So they they just like they just do it for free, a lot of it. So I was I was thinking like, but hey, guess who is good at generating money, right? So so why don't we like get combined? And you know, I was, it, what's funny is like I was I became friends with a nurse, um, and actually a doctor and a nurse, and I was talking to her. Her name is Dina, and she said, "You know what? I, you know, I'm thinking like um, I have this. We have this technology, medical technology that we developed, right? And uh, like the way our method and uh, somebody, some government agency expressed interest in buying this from us. It's like a method, like a, a medical method. And I was thinking about selling it to them for two dollars, and I said, okay." Um, why two dollars? You know, like why two dollars? You know, I just couldn't. So the mind is like that. They're not thinking because they're like, well, it's gonna save lives. And I said, it should be two thousand. Like you need to, you need to even pay for your ticket to go there, right? And to do something. So I felt like I, I can't re- remake them into money generating machines, but we can combine forces, and then maybe I yeah. would have the money and just give it to them. Because I asked them how much did that clinic cost, you know, the one that was shut down. They said, oh, we got a grant from federal government. It was about $200,000 for three years. For 100 children's lives. How cheap is that? This is incredibly cheap, especially with the cost of, you know, healthcare in this country. So I was like, I will just make that money and I'll just give that to you. I'll just give you the money and you just go, you save them, right? You open that clinic. Yeah. And, and so it's, to me, it was just mind blowing that I can do that, that we can Create. And so I decided with every mommy go um, purchase, we'll actually donate 
part of it because they have this really cute program which they take um, they buy baby hat uh, onesie and a blanket and then they they put it in the packet and they like send it to Africa right but in that packet there's like uh, like basic healthcare information about like instructions about what to do just it, it really works it was tested they were in like all these prestigious medical magazines and they're like on CDC website because that method that they do, it works. It's so ghetto, right? You just take something that's really cheap, really cute and small, and you just like stuff something useful, but it works. It saves yeah. actually lives, right? And so well, actually that's that's part of what people were trying to buy from this, is that method. We just do, how do you guys do that? Because we want to do it in our country. And that's what stuff that she was trying to sell for $2. <laughs> and so they're like, no, no, just, just forget. You're not good about making money. Just like, <laughs> I'll give the money to you, you know, and everything will be fine. You save the world, I'll make the money. So we're like, you know, we're doing, awesome. doing that. Um, and I feel like when I was looking around, and I'm looking at Connie, like what she does, right? She's uplifting people. Yeah. That is her thing, right? She People who went through trauma, through a loss, and they're trying to find themselves. She's helping them. Yeah. I was thinking like, uh, look, I'm doing my own like little things. And I know another lady, like she's saving the cats. And I'm like a huge cat person, right? My cat is trying to break through the door now. But uh, it's like she's saving the cats. She's opening the first cat cafe here in Las Vegas to save cats' lives, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But some lady is saving like bunnies. And then another woman, uh, she, uh, like the, my my tea friend, right? She's a tea revolutionary, saving Japanese farmers and like she farmers around the world. And I'm thinking each of us feel like a little superhero, like fighting our own battle in, in our own con- corner, right? What if we like maybe combine forces and you know, together. It's so much easier. When when I was dealing with this this whole discrimination thing, right, at UNLV, and I'm actually thinking, I was talking to this faculty that worked on it, and I'm thinking like, and they're saying how they were subjected to abuse. And I was saying like, look, you're a grown ass woman. You're a PhD, right? <laughs> Don't let somebody treat you like that. Stand up, you know, just do something, say something. And she's like, well, I have mortgage, I have kids. And I'm like, I know it's hard when you're on your own, but if you have like ten local business women, right, who are saying, "No, excuse me, like I like no, you can't just destroy her complaints, right?" Yeah, you need to do when you have like a lot of people backing you up. Yeah, and I've I've seen it over and over when this thing was unfolding, and eventually we ended up having like a little army, like kind of following us, like trying to protect the kids with us. And it was just a brand that was mostly my friends and friends of my friends and friends of the patients, right? But it was powerful because in the beginning, we'll go through these court hearings, three events, and it was just literally us, right? Just like little bunnies, you know, sitting in the corner. And eventually, it just grew to this big crowd. There was no room. There's people standing. Mm-hmm. And that's when things started to change because they realized that, hey, we better change or something bad will happen to us. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, I feel like we as women uh, are... We, we just take care of everything. Like, oh, I'll take care of you. Oh, I'll take care of you. But it's hard. Like, on your own, it's hard to save all the cats in the world. On your own, it's hard to save all the tea farmers in the world, right? All the HIV kids. It's hard to do it. It's hard to do. Like, you are, you are great at saving kids. Not so good about raising money, right? So I'm not good at saving kids, but I'm good at raising money. Why don't we, like, do it together? We do this. Mm-hmm. this. And, you know, be good. Like, you guys are doing, like, this this media, this podcast, right? And so uh, I'm re- I suck at media, like, so bad. So I just don't do good. Like, I'm, I'm, I decided to learn it because I realized how important it is. But you are giving visibility to all these uh, great people and entrepreneurs and interesting people in the community, right? So uh, you're helping me right now, right? So it's – and, you know, I, if you want to use me as a guinea pig or case study or whatever, so I, I'll be happy to help you volunteer for that. You know, it's a mutually beneficial thing for everybody. This is just the beginning. I'm telling you, you are one um, powerhouse. Powerhouse. Yeah. And you are definitely a princess. And a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because my goodness. when you were saying that it has to be simple, it has to fit, that's, you know, I, I teach business, but that's what I say all the time. If you don't understand it and you don't have the gift that you need to have, such as, you know, making the money. If your gift is not the raising the money, why are you spending all your time, you know, trying to do something you're not good at and not doing the thing you're good at? 
So you are you are absolutely singing my song of you know the, the, this is exactly collaboration. Yes. Yeah. How much yeah. can we accomplish if we don't care who gets the credit? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah. if we stay oh. focused on what needs to be done and let each other take on the part that, that matters. But you also have hit on something. You have people who are willing to pick up the pieces that they're good at and work together where it really disturbs me that you went to so many people whose job it is to take care of things like this and and everybody said oh yeah i i don't have time no they, you know, they all those people just, just kind of went on yeah it's the whole yeah. time. that's all i got and i was like uh i need we need medications you know we don't need hopes and prayers like that's what we need actually not even me but they need it and so i feel like a lot of times we, we can change our facebook status we can put a little hearts uh, but sometimes it takes something more. And I feel like as women, we're all brought up to be agreeable and being like nice, being nice. And me included, I'm very nice. You know, like I, I was brought up to be, to say yes. And, you know, to be a good, to be good, good citizen, right? Good person. I'm not a troublemaker. And so that really goes against us when we're up against that kind of situation. Like, am I allowed to say something now? Like, what is it now? Am I allowed to say something now? Like, where, where do you draw that line where you can't remain who you are? And I'm very protective by who I am. I feel like there's certain things I'm, I'm not going to compromise on. And, like, I draw the line with, like, killing cats and kids. I think that's something, like, I would, that's not acceptable to me. But so we have a mental tendency, and, and it's I, – I wrote an article about this one time, our mental thermostat. And it's set at different levels for different people. But it comes from our, our training when we're young. We know we can push our luck this far. And it starts when we're, we're a little kid and we went to the store with a parent and we're like, Dad, can I have this Barbie? Hey, Dad, can I have this Barbie? And we know if we ask one more time, we're in trouble. Right? Oh, and I yeah. think so many times as women, oh, we get the Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I think we're related. I'm telling you. <laughs> as women, we have a lower threshold, I think, a lower distance that we can push our luck you didn't stop there you kept pushing and going well that's not acceptable tell me more okay who can tell me more where can I go from here because you didn't you didn't stop when you hit you know what other people might have hit as a as an off switch oh I better stop now or something bad it's will happen not an option you know like the minute they would have given their medication mm -hmm. that's it I'm out but that's that the, the medical care, right? So just, yeah. just like treat them. I really don't care about what what the hell you guys are doing. Just like just treat them. Just take care of them because I don't. Just, it, I do it for selfish reasons. So I don't have to li live with myself. I first of all, like I can't watch a little kid die. Like my friends oh. can die. Like I, you know, you know, one of the things that I'm very. I found like I became like easy to cry. Like I, I don't know, like. I used to never cry ever, no matter what happens. And then I think after I had my kids, something like hormonally went wrong. <laughs> and now I cry. <laughs> so, and any kids in it, any story. So I try not to wind myself up and even like watch that kind of stuff. And I find that I like with this stuff, I was thinking like how when you listen to these parents, when you watch these kids, you're thinking like, how can I – I have this as a human like as a how can I like totally selfishly like how can I will watch this child and and you know sometimes you read the story like this little kid and sometimes you have an, a tragic accident or disease right that claims them and there's nothing you can do no matter like you appeal to God you appeal to the universe you you and I think any parent like if you say like look if you, you can save this child if you sail through the Pacific, right? Fight off the track. We will all do it. We will do it to save one kid. I would do it for random kid on the street. To say this kid has leukemia. You fight shark bare hand, that kid will live. I will do it. I swear to God. I will poke the shark's eye. Like maybe I'll die. Maybe the shark will eat me. Probably will. You know, I'm, I'm bad at swimming too. You know, I do it. Just be like ripping the gills out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a really good try because I feel like. It's, it's something is preventable, but a lot of times the tragic part is it's not preventable. 
Mm-hmm. You watch this and then you cry your eye, you, you cry your heart out. And you're thinking like, okay, these parents, they really want to. They really didn't deserve it. This kid didn't deserve it. But it cannot be helped. There's nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. You can change your Facebook status 100,000 times. That child is gone. That's it, right? So, but in this case, this is not one of those cases. It's treatable. They don't have to die. Like you're literally signing the death sentence by denying their medical. You are killing them. You're not, this is not leukemia. This is not something, you know, some other horrible disease. This is not, like sometimes you read, and like the other day, like a drunk driver hit some car with three teenagers from local school, right? And so uh, you can't, it, it, they're gone. That, that, that had just happened. You can, there's nothing you can do. There's no amount of sharks you can fight to bring them back. But these children, they're here. They're alive, right? So, they all they need is medication which you have you know like yeah. Yeah. I, I i hate to like stop because i think we could keep going throughout like the whole weekend i would love <laughs> to talk to you for another year yes but we are gonna have to like get off the session is like over time now but i am telling you i am so thankful to miss connie for introducing us to you and i'm thankful that there is that spirit in you that is not going to back up that is going to continue and i love that you're not a troublemaker you're not out looking for something but you're not going to back up if it if it lands in your lap you're going to you're going to fight the shark <laughs> and so will you. i mean honestly any of us would do it you are up against the corner for, for a child who's dying yes well it, this, Miss Connie has put things in the comments to make sure that we can get you connected. I want to make sure that we have um, your your mommy go information. Okay. I want to make sure we have all the information where we can like um, get connected with you. Any of our listeners can get connected and you know support so, your efforts, support what you're doing. But I I have to tell you from a completely princess selfish thing. I am so, so glad you're in my world. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. I'm honored that you be in your world. So. Oh, my goodness. You're just incredible. Thank you for everything you've done. And like I said, I hate cutting this off because, oh, my goodness, we want to do we want to do another round with you at some point because this is incredible. It is incredible. So thank you so much. Thank I love you. you. We'll collaborate. I love it. <laughs> you got her speechless, <laughs> Elena. I, know, I love it. it. <laughs> Probably because you took all her best lines. Like, just show <laughs> up. <laughs> <and> <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Hope the Hope Conference and, and joining us. If you um, if you didn't listen to all of this, you need to go back and rewind it because yes, you do. Wow, we. This woman is incredible. Um, she's the right kind of fighter, and she's the right kind of businesswoman, and she's the right kind of princess, and she's the right kind of, you know, how things should be done. So please go back and listen. We will be back in just a few minutes with the next session. This is Kim White with the My Sexy Business team. And Christy Bridges with One Moment Wiser. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.